Good morning, church. God is good. There you go. All the time. God is good. That is right. That is right. So we have been preaching through the book of James this summer, and today we're going to be out of James chapter 2. And so in just a moment, we're going to stand and read that. But to start off this morning, there's a couple of things I want to do. And first I want to do is I just want to recap for you verse 2 of chapter 1. And I want you to listen to this intently. So please uh, listen to this. It says, consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. So let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete. The testing of your faith produces perseverance, so let perseverance do its work. Scripture also tells us that we are part of one body, and when one person is hurting, we all hurt, right? We've been there. And when one person's rejoicing, we all rejoice because we are all one body. And a lot of the times, the hurt comes with testing. Well, today, we need to spend some time in prayer. And um, it's a little bit of a heavy heart this morning. Two families, two separate families that are connected to our church yesterday had two little ones pass away. And so we had uh, little Carter, who was a year old, and Princeton, who was between three and four years old, passed away last night. And so uh, a lot of questions come up in families. And as I read this passage, it says, I'm just going to read it again. It's, with that in mind, consider it pure joy, not the joy of what's happened, but the joy that we can find faith. My brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, it's a trial that none of us ever want to face, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance, and let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete. Today we have faith, and that's what we're going to be talking about. And the faith that we have today and the joy that we find today is we know those two little boys are face-to-face -face with Jesus today. Amen? But at the same time, there's pain and hurt in families. We don't understand all the circumstances surrounding it and the turmoil surrounding it, so we hurt with them. So this morning, we're going we're gonna to pray. And we're going to pray differently than we've prayed before. I believe wholeheartedly that our church has a voice. Amen? And so this is what I'm going to ask you to do faithfully. I'm going to pray for these little boys and these families that God surrounds these families with his spirit and a peace that surpasses all understanding. But I'm going to ask you as the church to pray along with me, not just in, not just in your mind, but I'm going to ask you to pray out loud because I believe our church has a powerful voice when it comes to prayer. So let's spend the next few moments praying for these families, praying for these mothers, and praying for peace. Will you join me? Father God, we come to you right now. As your church and as your body, God, our heart is heavy and it hurts for two little boys who have who have lost their lives yesterday, God. But we know that real life is found in you. And though we miss them here, God, we know that they are alive and well in your presence. So God, we pray right now, we pray for these families. God, we pray for the mamas, these mothers, that your, your peace, God, there's no, way, there's no way that there's peace found on earth to overcome something like this. But we know that your word says you give a peace that surpasses all understanding. So we pray right now for these families and these mothers, God, that your spirit brings a peace that we cannot even comprehend. God, we lift up all the circumstances. We know in the midst of this, God, that you are there. So we lift them up to you. And God, we pray in this moment that you make our, our faith strong. You make these mothers strong. You make these grandmothers and grandfathers strong. God, that you give them the strength to persevere. And God, we pray for your glory to be seen in all this. And we ask this, God, not, not doubting, but knowing that you overcome, that you've conquered death, and that today life is victorious. And we pray these things in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. Amen. I'm going to encourage you, continue lifting these two families up in prayer. Uh, the little boys' names were Carter and Princeton. So continue to pray for them. And pray long for them, because there is going to be a process of healing. But God is good. Amen. All the time? All the time. There we go. <laughs> we'll try that again. God is good. All the time. And all the time? God is good. Amen. Amen. Well, we're going to be coming this morning. We're going to be talking about faith and kind of this, this whole situation of what faith is this morning. So will you stand with me? Chapter 2 of James is where we're going to start in verse 14. If you can go ahead and bring the lights up so we can see our Bibles. And so we're going to start in verse 14. And I love this. James, just to kind of preface this so you know, James 
is the half-brother of Jesus. He would be the son of Joseph. We know that, that Mary was the mother of Jesus and that he was conceived by the Holy Spirit, but she was, she was betrothed to Joseph. So this would have been Joseph's son with Mary, and so it would have been the half-brother of Jesus. And so this was written about 15 years after Jesus died. And so he is writing this letter to all the churches because he's seeing some character traits and some behavior issues in the churches. So he's writing this letter to correct it. It's only five chapters long, but it hits you right between the eyes. And in this section, you'll pick it up. He's writing to the churches, but he introduces like a third person as if he's having a conversation with this third person so that he can use that third person as an example. So let's read this together. Verse 14, it says, What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if people claim to have faith but have no deeds? Can such faith save them? Suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about their physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. Everyone say dead. 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 But someone will say, you have faith, I have deeds. Show me your faith without deeds, and I will show you my faith by what I do. You believe that there is one God, good, even the demons believe that, and shudder. You foolish person, do you want evidence that faith without deeds is useless? Was not our father Abraham considered righteous for what he did when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? You see that his faith and his actions were working together, and his faith was made complete by what he did. And the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. And as he was called God's friend, you see that people are justified by what they do and not by faith alone. In the same way, was not even Rahab the prostitute considered righteous for what she did when she gave lodging to the spies and sent them off in a different direction. As the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without deeds is, everybody say it, dead. dead. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, God, we come to you this morning. We know your spirit's here, your presence is here. We've opened your word, God, and so we ask in these moments that you open our eyes as we read your words. As you open our hearts so that you, you show, show us how to draw near to you today, God, and teach us truth from your word. And may we absorb it and be faithful to it. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. So as we're going through here, looking at James chapter 2, it's interesting. Verse 14 says, now, parents, you're familiar with this. We often ask questions that have the answer built into it, right? And often it sounds like this. If your friends were to go jump off a bridge, would you too? And what should the answer be? No. But sometimes we got a smart aleck kid and they say, well, maybe. It depends which friend, right? But no, we often ask questions that already have the answer no built into it. It's called cynicism. This is what James is starting off with. And he says, what good is it, my brothers and sisters, if people claim to have faith but no deeds? Can that faith save them? And we would all say no. Say it. No. no. Faith without deeds is dead, so that faith cannot save them. So I have to put a disclaimer out here. This is one of the most difficult passages in the Bible to understand because it talks about works. The Bible is very clear that works do not save you. Ephesians 2, 8, and 9 says this, by faith you have been saved, right? Not by works. That means you cannot earn your way to heaven. You cannot be a good enough person. If you live your life by the philosophy that if I do enough good stuff to outweigh my bad stuff, I'll go to heaven, you'll be dead wrong. And as Christians, we cannot do enough to earn, deserve salvation. A lot of times as Christians, we fall into this strut of trying to do enough good things so we can even deserve the salvation that Christ has already given to us freely. And what James is talking about here is different than that. It's not trying so hard. What James is talking about here is the deeds of the Holy Spirit that come through us. Now listen, this is how it works. When we become a Christian, when we experience salvation through Christ, the Holy Spirit transforms our hearts and becomes its dwelling place. That means that the transformation that happens in us is by God's work alone. It's supernatural. And the Holy Spirit lives in us and through us. And it's the obedience to that Holy Spirit that's the works that James is talking about. It's not something we try to do on our own. It's not something we try to earn. It's us being obedient to the Holy Spirit that James is talking about here. As he says, faith without works is Dead. Okay, you guys are going to catch up. I know this. All right. <laughs> there you go. All right. So can such faith save them? No. Suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about their physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, 
if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. dead. There you go. So here's the first point for today. You guys ready? Faith always requires an action. You might want to write that one down. Faith always requires an action. If there is no action, your faith is dead. That's what James just told us. Faith without action is dead. So here's the deal. As we look at faith, what is our faith? If you turn just a few pages over to your left, in Hebrews 11, chapter 11, verse 1, I'm going to read this to you. A lot of us have this memorized. It says, now faith is being sure. Everybody say sure. Sure. Sure means positive, right? We're being sure of what we hope for and certain, everybody say certain, certain of what we do not see. Faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. There is no doubt, right? So what is our faith? As followers of Christ, what are we certain of? What are we sure of? This is it right here summed up. We believe that Jesus Christ was the Son of God. Amen? That he came to earth and that he paid the price for sin for you and for me. On the cross, he took our place of death. And he was the ultimate sacrifice, the perfect sacrifice. That we are sure of, amen? That he died three days later after being buried, rose again to life, conquering death and sin, amen? We are sure of that today. Our hope of the future to come is that Christ gave us life through that. Just as those two little boys we talked about earlier today, death, where is your sting? Today they're alive in heaven. We are sure of that. That is the hope of the unseen. We may not see them here on earth, but we know they're alive today in heaven. We know that Jesus has conquered death and sin, and we know that he is coming again for us as his church, as his kingdom, and that he will deliver us into eternity, into his life, not the broken life that we have on earth, but this is what we're sure of, amen? So that is what our faith is is Jesus is coming back for us. So what is our action? Faith always requires action. Let's go back to the Great Commission, Matthew 28. Go into all the world, baptizing them, making disciples, and teaching them to obey everything that I have taught you. That's what Jesus said. Your action is this. Go into all the world, make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to make disciples. We call that kingdom building. We pray for the kingdom of God to come on earth. That is because we are kingdom builders. That is our action. Because we believe what I just said about Christ, that makes each and every one of us a kingdom builder. So our action, our faith is required in action. Our action is building the kingdom. It looks different in every single one of our lives. Some of you are called to your workplace. There's people at your workplace that need to know Jesus. Some of you are called to QT, where you buy your soda every day. Some of you are called to jails. We have people who go to jails every Monday night and share Christ. God has put a mission field before each and every one of us because we have faith and it requires an action. And this is interesting. As you look in the Old Testament, you look in the New Testament, and we see all these monsters of faith, these guys and these women who were just these champions of faith, and we look at them going, wish I could, I'm not like them. I wish I could be like them. No, you are. They were messed up like we're messed up. What they did is they put action to their faith. In fact, if I continue in chapter 11, just listen to this. I'm just going to summarize some of the things that happened in chapter 11. By faith, Abel brought God a better offering than Cain did. By faith, Enoch was taken from this life. By faith, Noah, when warned about things not yet seen, in holy fear built an ark to save his family. By faith, Abraham, when called to go to a place he would later receive as an inheritance, obeyed and went, even though he did not know where he was going. By faith, Abraham went, when God tested him, offered Isaac as a sacrifice. By faith, Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau in regard to their future. By faith, Jacob, when he was dying, blessed each of Joseph's sons. By faith, Joseph, when his end was near, spoke out about the Exodus and the Israelites from Egypt. By faith, Moses' parents hid him for three months after he was born. By faith, Moses, when he had grown up, refused to be known as the son of Pharaoh's daughter. By faith, people passed through the Red Sea. By, pa by faith, the walls of Jericho fell. By faith, the prostitute Rahab, because she welcomed the spies, was not killed with those who were disobedient. Faith requires an action. Every time something comes up that challenges our faith, God is putting an action before us so that we can step into it. That's why we count trials as joy. It gives us a chance to step out in faith which produces perseverance, and per perseverance takes us closer to completeness. Faith requires an action. So let's continue. Verse 18, back in James chapter 2. 
But someone will say, now this is where he introduces this, this phantom third person that he's using as an example. But someone will say, you have faith, I have deeds. Show me your faith without deeds, and I will show you my faith by what I do. You believe that there is one God, good, even the demons believe that and shudder. Here's the deal. I was a, I'm a child of the 80s and a student of the 90s. And in the 80s, skating began to hit its stride. Skateboard. Not roller skates. Skateboards. And uh, it was interesting. And actually, it, it incorporated a term that actually originated in surfing. And it was this term, it was called a poser. Now, here's, here's what a poser was. If you, if you don't know what a poser was, this is what a poser is. This poser that originated with surfing was somebody that was a surfer or a skater that dressed like a surfer or a skater, that looked like a surfer or a skater, that talked like a surfer or a skater. But if you were to put a surfboard or a skateboard in front of them, they couldn't do anything with it. They were posing. And that was actually the biggest offense to the surfing community or to the skating community is that somebody would pretend to be part of their community and not be able to do it, right? This is what James is calling out the church. He's calling them posers. He's like, a lot of you look like Christians. A lot of you talk like Christians. A lot of you smell like Christians and dress like Christians. But when you actually put the Christian life in front of you, you're a poser. Now, here's, here's, here's what a lot of this looks like outside the church. Oh, I believe in God. I just, I just worship him at home. All right? Have you heard that one? We've all heard that. I've got friends like that. Or, you know, I... I, I, I go to church and everything, and it's great on the weekends, but on, throughout the week, I'm about my job, and I work, and I work, and I work, and that church thing is just for the weekends. Those are posers. Now, here's the deal. We live in, an Ameri we live in America, which is a Christian nation, right? And you, if you were to go out into our community and ask them, do you believe in God? Most people would say, yes. And that's true. Most people would say yes. And then you ask, how does that play out in your life? And most people would be like, I don't know. I don't know. It does it. And that's why this, this is a very important part. Belief in God is different than trusting God. Belief in God is different than trusting God. Trusting in God is having faith. Believing in God is just acknowledging his existence. And James says, good, you believe God. I'm God. So do the demons. Great job. <laughs> right? Now, I want us to be very clear right now. This is going to sting a little bit. If James was here this morning preaching, he would not be calling out America. He'd be calling out South Peoria Baptist Church. He wrote this letter to the church. He didn't write this to non-believers. He didn't write this to people who pretended to be believers. He wrote this to the church and said, no, this is you. Quit pretending. You want to know what faith looks like? This is what faith looks like. The Holy Spirit living through you. The Holy Spirit living through you and doing deeds through you. Not you trying to do it on your own. Not you talking all your Christianese language. Not you coming to church on Sundays and worshiping and praising and going out the rest of the week and living by yourselves. But this is what a Christian is. is a Christian is somebody who lives the life. And look at this. Galatians 5.22 talks about the fruit of the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit is peace, love, joy, happiness, self-control, and kindness. Remember I talked earlier. These aren't the works that we try to do. This is, James is talking about the works that the Spirit does through us. Our identity is, should not be church members. Our identity should be that guy over there that he shows love. Like, I don't get it, but he loves people. The world should see us as love. I don't get it, but he's kind even when people are mean to him. I don't get it, but he's really gentle and everybody else is really you know, arrogant and just really vulgar. What is going on here? Our identity should be found in the spirit, which is actually attaches us to the church and makes us part of the body. It should never be the church member or the guy who goes to church on Sunday, but the spirit working through each and every one of us. Let's continue on. Verse 20. So he's calling out this person now, this third person that's not in the church because he doesn't want to make them the prime example, but he's making somebody in the church an example. He says, you foolish person, do you want evidence that faith without deeds is useless? Was not our father Abraham considered righteous for what he did when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? You see that his faith and his actions were working together, and his faith was made complete by what he did. Now, this is very important. It says his faith and his actions were working together. And his faith was, faith was made complete by what he did. We have to be very careful treading lightly here going forward because this is one of the most difficult passages in Scripture because we are talking about works and deeds. But we cannot be mistaken in thinking that works and deeds save us. Faith and works work together. 
faith and deeds work together. And we're going to see as he goes a little bit farther. And the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. And he was called God's friend. You see that people are justified by what they do and not by faith alone. This is probably one of the most difficult sentences in all of scripture. I'm going to read again. You see that people are justified by what they do and not by faith alone. That's because faith always requires action. He goes on to explain. In the same way was not even Rahab the prostitute considered righteous for what she did when she gave lodging to the spies and sent them off in a different direction. And here is a great explanation. As the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without deeds is dead. And here we find the beautiful, mysterious balance that God has created. Look around the room right now. Just look around. This room is full of bodies. And these bodies are blessed with the sanctity of life. Right? How do we know you're alive? Well, we can go and get a... a, a doctor, or we could get a blood pressure machine and hook it up to you, and we can see your heartbeat and your blood pressure. Some of you may be a little too high because you like the bacon and eggs, but we can see that your body is alive, right? But your body's not eternal, is it? The most important part about you is what? Your soul. If we were to separate your soul from your body, what do you become? Your body becomes dead. So James is expressing to us, he goes, Faith in deeds is like a soul and a body. The soul is the eternal, important part. The body alive is what is reflecting the life of that soul. And so the soul is eternal, but the body shows us as proof that it's alive. Let's go to faith and deeds. This is what it is. Deeds itself do not save you. But as we're saved through grace, through Christ, the Holy Spirit dwells inside of us. We become alive in Christ because he conquered death and sin, and then the Holy Spirit dwelling inside of us begins to work through us and becomes proof of who we are in Christ. Amen? When we see the act of the Holy Spirit inside of us and we see the gentleness, the kindness, the self-control, the things of our life, and we become obedient and stepping out in faith, then that becomes the proof, the action of our faith. See, even Romans tells us, if you believe in your heart, and confess with your mouth. That's an action, isn't it? Because it's believing in the heart is where the faith begins. It's where salvation starts. And the first action is confession that Jesus is Lord. See, you could confess. You could do that without believing in your heart and you're not saved. That's not where sal- salvation is not in the action. It's not in the deeds. The action is the proof of the life that God has given us in our hearts. That is where life comes from. That is the proof that when we see another Christian, we see the supernatural life that has been built into their hearts. A body apart from the spirit is dead, and faith absence, faith absence of deeds is dead. Everybody say dead. dead. Faith absent of deeds is dead. They do not save us. We do not strive for them, but we do them because we obey the spirit. And so the truth is, our actions reveal the nature of our faith. Our actions reveal the nature of our faith. If we are a, a uh, Sunday Christian, then our faith is not real. It's dead. If we just live like it between 10.30 and 12 on Sundays, well, let's go to 11.30 because sometimes we run long and our stomachs get grumpy and we want to go eat, right? Our faith is dead. If there's no proof of who Christ is in your life through the Holy Spirit, faith is dead. There's a small country church full of farmers, and uh, the one year came, it was especially hard. It was a drought. And so at the beginning of the summer, they were okay. They were thinking they're going to make it, and pretty soon all the reservoirs dried up. It was an agriculturally driven community, and a small little country church, and the farmers started really, really, really fearing what was going to come because if there's no water, then you have nothing growing. And if you have nothing growing, then you have no livestock because the livestock dies, which means this could totally destroy their whole community. So the pastor of that little country church decides to to do something, and he puts together a prayer meeting to pray for rain, a a rain prayer meeting. And so he goes and puts this together, puts it up all over the community, and the night comes for this prayer meeting. And he's standing at the front door, and his normal church members come in, and he's excited. 
start seeing them. Really excited, really full of joy. And then pretty soon, the people who only come like once a month or twice a month show up, and they, they come in. And then pretty much the, the CEOs showing, you know, the Christmas and Easter only people start coming in. And then people who never come to church start coming in. And pretty soon, his little country church where he was so joyful is packed. And then he becomes saddened. And he walks up to the pulpit at the time that this, the prayer meeting was supposed to start. And everybody thought he was under the weight of how despairing the situation was. And he stood up in the pulpit, and he says this. He says, we all know why we are here tonight. The only question I have, the only thing I want to know, is where are your umbrellas? Faith without action is dead. James told us earlier, if you ask and you doubt, it's not going to come. Faith without action is dead. Dead. Now, this is a mysterious balance here because our actions reflect our faith. Our actions show the nature of our faith. And it's interesting. I think my favorite story that, that really wraps this up in what James is saying, there's this, there's this little old man, and his job was to row a boat across the river. He carried people across the river. He ferried people across this river. Every day he was faithful, and he loved his job. And one day he picked up the passenger on one side of the river, and he gets in the boat, and he starts rowing across the river. And the passenger notices that on each of his oar is carved one word. And one oar says faith, and the other oar says works. And they're about halfway across this river, and he's, he's rowing, you know, plying on these oars. And the passenger asks, why does your oar say faith and works? He goes, well, let me show you. So he drops the oar that says faith and just oars with the, with the paddle that says works. And pretty soon, we all know what happens, right? The boat's just going in a circle. He's like, okay, I get it. He goes, no, you don't. You don't get it. So he drops the oar that says works and picks up the oar that, the oar that says faith and starts rowing with that one. And pretty soon the boat starts going in a circle in the other direction, right? And the pastor's like, all right, I get it. He goes, no, you don't. And he picks up both the oars and starts rowing at the same time. And they start going on their, on their journey. And he says, that is it. You see, that is the way it is in the Christian life. Dead works without faith are useless. And faith without works is dead, also getting you nowhere. But faith and works pulling together make for safety, progress, and blessing. So today, as we sit here and we talk about faith and works, and we understand the balance of faith and works, is by faith we are saved through grace, not by works. But the works are a reflection of the nature of our faith. We talked about Abraham. God told Abraham, I want you to sacrifice your son. And it's the only place, the only time God has ever asked for a human sacrifice other than Jesus. And so Abraham, who believed God, understood it wasn't enough just to believe God is good. So he made the long journey up the mountain with his son and was prepared to do what God asked. And he pulled the knife out, raised the knife, and God said, stop. Your faith has made you righteous. And God provided a ram for, God, for Abraham to, to sacrifice instead. The action of Abraham proved his faith. Our actions prove our faith. So today, it brings us to a very simple question. Very simple question that's going to be hard for us to ask and for us to reflect on. But this is the question. Is my faith dead? Everybody say dead. 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 I believe God has created South Peoria Baptist Church on this corner for a reason. You hear me say this a lot. I believe that he has called us all to build the kingdom here at South Peoria. But we can only do that if our faith is alive. See, as we look around this room, I see the kingdom. And God has called us together to build the kingdom, to reach this community with the love of Christ and the gospel. But we cannot do that if our faith is dead. If we show up here every Sunday morning asking God to move and we don't bring our umbrellas, our faith is dead. So this morning we have to ask the question as a church, is my faith dead? We have to ask that and then ask God, how do I, how do I come alive in your spirit? God, I don't want to be dead. I want to be alive and be what you created me to be. I want to be on mission, building your kingdom every single day in the way that you created me to do so. So that's our question today. In just a few moments, just a few moments, we're going to sing another song. We're going to call this, we call this a time of, of response. 
This is a time for the whole church. And so whether you come down, we open up our altar. You can come down and kneel down at the altar and pray. You can come up and pray with our leaders. Or you can sit right there in your chair. But don't let the time of response in our church pass you by. Because every time we open God's word, it is a reflection and a mirror into our soul. And God is asking us to respond to it. So today, whether you come forward or you stay in your chairs, don't let this pass you up without responding to what God is doing in your life. If you're here today and you don't know Jesus Christ and you want to know what it is to experience life through Christ, I'm going to encourage you in just a few moments, you come on down here and speak to one of our leaders and they will introduce you to how to know Jesus and you can experience that life. So I'm going to pray here in just a moment. Our, our band's going to come up. We're going to sing another song and I'm going to encourage you, be bold in response. Be transparent with God and let's go to him together. Heavenly Father God, we come to you this morning and we ask this question as a church. Is our faith dead? God, we want to know what it is to be alive in you. We want to know what it is to have a faith that is alive, a faith that changes the world because we're obedient, a faith that changes the world because the Holy Spirit lives inside of us and we're living through your spirit. So God, give us the strength to be bold. Give us the ability to hear the answer when we ask you the question, is my faith dead? Give us the strength to examine our hearts, to draw close to you. God, let your scripture pour through our hearts today. Let your, let your truth and your spirit pour through our hearts today and our minds today, God. If we need to be, be repentant, bring us to our knees. If we need to be bold, bring us the boldness and the courage, God. But either way, we give you these next few moments as we sing your praise and we respond with our hearts to our creator. In your name we pray, amen.